RDNA 3 may be AMD's first foray into a chiplet-based graphics architecture for consumer graphics, but the company have paved the way with previous research and products such as their Ryzen range of processors. Zen 2, when it launched with the Ryzen 3000 series, made huge waves in the industry with its chiplet-based design, and AMD have certainly brought a lot of that research and technology forwards. AMD have also recently released a ton of slides for the RX 7000 series in RDNA 3 architecture, and as you probably guessed, we're going to be covering that rather extensively in this video. In fact, there are so many slides that I had to kind of take a cherry-picked approach, discussing the most important and influential pieces of technology. This gives us a great insight into not only AMD's plans with RDNA 3, but their vision going forward with not just graphics and the inevitable RDNA 4 and its latest successes, but CPUs and other platforms. And of course, we're going to discuss all of that right after this message from the video's sponsor. Create, share and play games with today's sponsor, Struct. Struct is an app for creating, playing, and sharing games where you can bring your game ideas to life without any need for coding skills. It's really simple to get your dream game project off the ground. You can choose from ready-made templates to start you off with a foundation for your ideas, or start with a blank canvas and go from there. Plus, the app is completely free, allowing everyone and anyone to create or play games. More than 2 million games have been created and uploaded on Struct, including the current flagship title, Struct Showdown. I was able to install the Struct app and choose from their huge library of games within minutes, and quickly jumped into a game. Showdown is a fun, jump-in-and-out, team-based, third-person shooter that plays well, despite the limitation of touchpad controls, and makes for a great demonstration of what can be created with Struct. Plus, the app is regularly updated based on feedback from content creators and gamers. And you can get started for free today at the link in our description. Struct is available for iPhone, iPad, and Android. So guys, let's just quickly tackle the elephant in the room. The setup looks a little different and kind of janky, but what's going on? Well, I'll tackle this much more in a upcoming vlog, but basically this is just a very temporary setup for the next week or two while things get resolved and then things will get moved into a very different setup and things will start to get organized over the next month or so. So yeah, just a quick note because I know many people are gonna be asking, I know the lighting isn't ideal, the camera angle looks a little weird and stuff like that, but there's just stuff everywhere at the moment and things are what they are, but things will return more to normal over the next couple of weeks slash months and i think the channel is going to have a very strong future going forward let's just say that uh, and by the way for those wondering yes that is an rtx 4090 and we're going to be doing a lot of coverage on the uh, 4090 and a lot of other stuff going forward of course rdna3 being included and this is certainly not the only rdna3 video we're going to be discussing uh, amd are going to be releasing the graphics architecture next month of course so we're going to do a lot more of an extensive investigation into rdna3 when the cards launch we can start doing some actual testing to many of amd's claims but also i'm planning to discuss how rdna3 is going to impact future consoles with numerous uh, benefits to the technology and of course also AMD's vision going forward plus many other cool things. With that said, let's get into it. So let's start with the very basics. The Radeon RX 7900 XT and the 7900 XTX are both powered by the Navi 31 Silicon, which is a chiplet based design incorporating AMD's next generation graphics IP, RDNA 3, and several other very cool approaches which are only conceivable with a chiplet architecture. The flagship card will retail at 999 US dollars, while the lower end, RX 7900 XT, will cost 100 bucks less. So, 899 US dollars, and both will see a launch in mid December. Navi 31 is comprised of a single GCD graphics compute die built using TSMC's 5NM process, weighing in around 300 square millimeters and up to six MCDs memory cache dies for the flagship, with the 7900 XT shaving the countdown to just five. Each MCD weighs in at 37 square millimeters and uses TSMC's 6NM process. Why 6NM? Well, it was chosen for a simple reason. Some stuff just doesn't shrink down as well using smaller nodes, and AMD have already employed this strategy in the past. For example, back on Zen 2, they used the 7NM process from TSMC, while the IOD was built using either the 12 or 14 nm depending on the application of the processor, using uh, a manufactured by Global Foundries. The GCD houses the stream processors, ALUs, ROPs, TMUs, AI, display engines, etc., whilst the MCDs serve as both the Infinity Cache, 
16 megabytes for each MCD, totaling 96 megabytes for the flagship, and also a memory controller. So, because of the aforementioned chop of MCDs from 6 to 5, the 7900XT sees a reduced bus width from 384 to 320 bit. Of course, the frame buffer also is similarly reduced as well, from 24 gigabytes down to just 20, as each MCD acts as a memory controller. Therefore, fewer GDDR6 chips can be addressed. The total Infinity Cache therefore drops as well to 80 megabytes from 96 megabytes of the 7900XTX. So, with AMD's decision to go with chiplets, it's not just about now, but also the future. In the simplest terms, the more powerful a GPU or CPU is, the larger the die becomes because you need to add more ALU, more cache, more IO, and other logic. As a very rough comparison point, and this is not technically accurate for numerous reasons, not least of which is the processor is quite a bit different. AMD's Narve 31 GCD is around half the size of NVIDIA's AD102, which powers the RTX 4090. AMD's design also differs substantially from NVIDIA's as well, not just because of the chiplet nature of the design, but also NVIDIA dedicates a lot of space to its RT and Tensor cores. AMD's really places more of an emphasis on silicon budget, preferring to spend less on custom accelerators, but we'll get much more in depth into this throughout the video. Larger mono dies though are much more costly to produce, particularly due to TSMC and other fabs charging more for denser nodes. They have a greater chance of defects, generate more heat, and require more power, and of course, there's also flexibility. I'll talk more about flexibility and the future designs in probably another video, because I have quite a good understanding now I think of AMD's vision going forward. But ultimately, you can't just keep scaling chips to bigger and bigger and bigger sizes. Even in a hypothetical world filled with pixie dust, with manufacturing costs just not mattering to you, reticle limit means that there's a physical limit you can actually design a chip. Many of you may recall that Zen 2's CPU architecture marked the company's first leap into chiplets. And it was a really big deal at the time. You can see a few slides on screen. With the Ryzen 3000 series, AMD scaled up to 16 cores, doubling that of the Zen 1 architectures. To do this, AMD segmented their processors into a CCD, core compute dies, and an IOD, input slash output die. As the names imply, the former houses the CPU logic, such as numerous processor cores and caches, whilst the IOD serves to talk to the rest of the system. For example, PCIe lanes, for example, for your graphics card. As you can see though from AMD's slide here, the raw cost is a big factor, essentially halving the cost versus a traditional monolithic die. Despite many lessons being learnt with AMD Zen 2 and its successors, most recently Zen 4, they just couldn't copy and paste the same design. It just doesn't work. GPUs require massive amounts of bandwidth to feed them. And as you can see in this, can it work for graphics slide, we're dealing with an absolutely tremendous increase in connectivity versus a CPU as well. So then, AMD leverages the Fanel interconnects. These have numerous benefits, density being the most obvious. In the leftmost image here, you can see 25 wires of a Zen Infinity fabric processor. AMD points out that CPUs require hundreds of signals, wires if you want, versus thousands of a GPU. This is because density is a huge deal. And as you can see in the rightmost image, there are 50 wires. Basically speaking, they are packed into a much smaller space versus the 25 of the CPU. This reduces a footprint, yes, but also power consumption. All of this means that the GPU has access to gigantic amounts of memory bandwidth, while also offering lower latency and high performance. Switching to the actual compute dies themselves and the architecture of RDNA 3, AMD have, well, they've just done a lot versus the older graphics IPs. In the overview slide, RDNA 3, Premium Advanced Graphics, we get some kind of highlight reel as the biggest upgrades over its predecessor, RDNA 2. TFLOPs increased by a factor of 2.7 times over Narve 21's figure, achieved via a combination of both higher clocks and more ALUs whilst performance per watt is increased by 1.54 times. 
The caching system just sees extensive renovations across the board, not just in the Infinity cache, but L2, L1 and L0. RT also gets a big overhaul of course, and there's almost endless changes to the stream processors and pixel pushing slash geometry powers of RDNA 3. Consider this video then a summary of sorts as the changes of RDNA 3 over 2. A full deep dive on each element would just eat too much time, and I think would probably be better served when the cards are officially launched so we can do more practical and first hand testing. But talking about the processors themselves, the workgroup processors were extensively overhauled. Frankly, I think that these are probably the biggest CU changes since AMD have switched from GCN to RDNA with the RX 5000 series. A quick glance might tell you that this statement of mine is just not true, but I'm sure you'll agree that if you inspect things more carefully, you will see a lot of changes. Starting out with the enhanced compute unit pair, this looks in principle very similar to RDNA 2, but brings us not so neatly actually into one of the biggest sources of confusion of Nave 3X, the number of shaders. There have been a number of outlets reporting both 12,288 and also 6,144 shaders. Which is the correct figure somewhat depends on perspective. Looking at the general overview, you'll see that there are two blocks. The first reads float slash int slash matrix simd32, and the second is float slash matrix simd32. Basically, AMD have doubled the FP32 compute performance, so in this respect, the number of cores is doubled because there are 128 FP32 cores, but there's only 64 integer 32 units. In essence, though, basically, you can think of the CUs as being much smarter in how they deal with instructions. In theory, throughput should be as high as possible, for example, within a gaming workload. AMD have also spent a small amount of die space for dedicated AI cores too, albeit these are part and parcel of the CU. They are known as AI matrix accelerators, a name possibly reminiscent of something you'd have heard in an 80s sci-fi movie. They sport FB16 in 4 WMMA and should offer, again, a 2.7 times speed increase. Looking at the slides, I think they also share some of the same execution resources as, say, the FP32 units, but this is not specifically stated. Let's also spend a moment glancing over the caching system of RDNA 3. I'll focus on the RX 7900 XTX here, but you can think of the same principles of its smaller brother, albeit with concessions like the smaller Infinity Cache. Let's look at things in a reverse order. In the optimized and balanced caching system slide, we can see that there's a large pool of data, of course, being held in the GDDR6 memory, 24 gigabytes in the flagship. This offers up to 960 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. This is further augmented with 96 megabytes of Infinity Cache, and then an L2 cache is 6 megabytes. This is increased by 1.5 times compared to Navi 21, and then L1 doubles this in capacity. L0 also sees a similar change. Yet another key change for RDNA 3 in its strategy for AMD for graphics is by increasing the capacity of caches. Obviously, data doesn't need to be evicted so strictly if the caches are larger. Farming I.O. requests out to say GDDR6 has a pretty big latency penalty and can result in stalls in the rendering pipeline. Notice too that the overall speed of data transfers across the chip and caches have also seen significant bumps too. A great example is the 2304B slash clock figure. Providing the total infinity cache bandwidth that we saw here, you can multiply the 2304 by the shader clock, and this gives you the 5.3 terabytes per second of bandwidth. As usual though, figures such as this are generally considered to be peak bandwidth, and effective bandwidth, or to put it another way, the more realistically achievable figure in games and applications is often lower. This is dictated to by a number of different things, but not least of which is hit rate. This is impacted by, again, numerous factors. For example, the resolution that you're playing the game in. Retired engineer Wild Sea and Fantal had a rather nice conversation about this on Twitter. Of course, I'll leave a link in the description. It appears that RDNA 3 has a hit rate for its infinity cache of about 0.48. So again, the peak bandwidth is 5.3 terabytes per second, 
but the effective bandwidth is more like 3.5 terabytes a second. And the Infinity Cache itself is connected via 768 links per MCD. So you need to times or multiply, whatever you want to say, 768 by either 5 or 6, depending on the variant of the uh, 7900 series that we're discussing. Ultimately, AMD's Infinity Cache for this generation of RDNA is much more efficient, effective, and performant than its predecessor. And N31 makes up for the lower capacity relative to N21 via a mixture of raw GDDR6 bandwidth, cache speed, as well as, of course, efficiency. But whether your GPU is 10 teflops, 100 teflops, it really doesn't matter if the GPU itself has numerous bottlenecks in its pixel pushing power or its command processor causing other stalls for gaming. Fortunately, AMD have done a lot of work across the board to optimize this. The first big change we should talk about in the graphics pipeline is something that comes later actually in the graphics pipeline, so it's ironic we're talking about it so early, and this is the ROP count. So AMD essentially have increased the ROP count by 50%, so 192 of the 7900 XTX versus the 128, which was still impressive for RDNA 2's flagship offerings. Worthy of note, though, is that this 50% figure is based purely on pixels per clock. To put things in another way, 192 ROPs can handle more pixels than 128 at the same speed, but obviously N31 runs at a higher clock speed anyway, tipping the pixel pushing battle even more so towards, AM, towards RDNA 3. ROPs basically act as the final stage in a rendering pipeline, essentially assembling the image, which is then plonked on screen. It's a lot more complex and nuanced than the following statement, as obviously there could be a lot of bottlenecks throughout the pipeline, but basically higher pixel throughput is very important for higher resolution images, because higher resolutions, like 4K, literally have more pixels than, say, 1440p. ROPs also do a lot of other stuff, not least of which is things like anti-aliasing. But let's move over to the command processor. This is something that typically doesn't get that much hype. Compared to, say, core counts, memory bandwidth, and other such big headline elements, it's usually somewhat ignored, but arguably it's actually more important. GPUs basically work on huge batches of commands, and historically those are issued from the host CPU in the form of command buffers. Again, I want to keep things as simple as possible here, but you can think of the CPU as sending stuff to the GPU, and the command processor basically then needs to issue instructions to the rest of the card, and then it needs to keep track of the jobs and so on. AMD have done a lot of work on RDNA 3's command processor, and subsequently reduced CPU workloads for things like drivers and APIs. An example of this work is reduced the overhead is the multi-draw indirect accelerator, MDIA. Indirect drawing is actually a function of DirectX 12, and if you've been following tech for some time, you might recall one of the earliest touted features of DirectX 12 was execute indirect, which is somewhat related. In simple terms, this is a feature of DirectX 12, as well as other APIs like Vulkan, but we'll be sticking to Microsoft for now, and it allows you to issue a single draw call and then the scene can be updated, called whatever, based on GPU compute commands. So the ability to execute these commands is not RDNA 3 exclusive, but what AMD have done with RDNA 3 is design MDIA. This is basically a bit of silicon within RDNA 3, which AMD have dedicated to increasing throughput. There's that word again. AMD have claimed that this increases performance on those specific commands anyway by 2.3 times. I've saved arguably the biggest weakness of RDNA 2 for last and how AMD have fixed it for RDNA 3. You probably guess what I'm going to say, ray tracing performance. RT for AMD was much lower in performance than its NVIDIA counterparts. Although this was largely a decision of design, AMD's desire to create an architecture as much at home in say a games console as a high-end PC necessitated the maximum use of die space. NVIDIA's strategy with RTX 20, as well as later GeForce cards, was to spend a lot of die space on both RT and Tensor cores. The RT cores doing, well, what they say on the 10, and the Tensor cores essentially doing AI, including DLSS. But this would not work so well with the RDNA 2 design with the PlayStation 5 or Xbox Silicon. So what this meant was a number of uh, performance concessions. 
With RDNA 2, the ray tracing accelerators were capable of four ray slash box intersections per clock, or a single ray slash triangle intersection per clock. What this means was a number of performance concessions with RDNA 2 ray tracing accelerators capable of four rays slash box intersections per clock or a single ray slash triangle intersection, but this is per CU. But this cannot be run concurrently with texturing operations. This is pretty well documented, including from Microsoft's Xbox Series X breakdown of its dual compute units. For reference, the PS5 and desktop RDNA 2 handle things basically identically. Basically, this meant that the architecture scaled not just with the number of TMUs, as I pulled dual duty for RT as well, but also the raw clock frequency of the GPU as well. There was no actual BVH traversal hardware, which is basically a tree structure of nodes containing scene data. NVIDIA did have hardware to uh, speed up this process. This all changed though with RDNA 3, and not only do we see BVH traversal incorporated, but there's a myriad of other architecture tweaks to help out. A big tweak for RDNA 3 is the CU. VGPR, or Vector General Purpose Registers, are now 50% larger, allowing for a corresponding increase in the number of rays in flight. And surprisingly, AMD are calling this the second generation of ray tracing, and also allows improved efficiency by allowing uh, developers to say have closest node first or largest first, and this is a direct quote, new hardware and specialized box sorting modes to improve performance by reducing traversal iterations for different ray types. AMD also allows the discarding of empty ray quads, optimizing the cycle per ray. According to their own data, the larger caches, improved architecture and other tweaks allow up to an 80% increase in RDNA 2 in ray tracing. Naturally, this is without independent testing. At a pure guess, and I do not have access to the card to know this for certain, but I suspect performance will change over time as developer tweaks and optimizations start to creep into the game engine. With that said, I think Nvidia will probably maintain the ray tracing advantage going forward. There's also a number of other changes AMD have stuffed into the latest architecture. For example, the dual media engines. These focus on other features, such as hardware support for AV1, a well-received feature for both Intel's Arc and NVIDIA's RTX 40 series. Further to this, you can leverage AI-enhanced video decoding. For example, AI can be used to enhance the text of video as it's being encoded, particularly helpful in low bitrate slash resolution scenarios, for example, streaming. Of course, AMD have also made quite a big deal of supporting DisplayPort 2.1, if nothing else, it's a nice PR win for AMD to be sure, but it does have practical benefits if you're planning to adopt the requisite display to take advantage of the tech. Outside of all of the hardware stuff, and yeah, I'm missing a plethora of things here, there are also other features like HyperRx announced. Now this is not RDNA 3 specific, but it acts basically as an easy toggle of sorts, providing extra performance by enabling AMD's RSR, albeit this is still using FSR1, not FSR2, anti-lag, and so on. Performance increases quite substantially, as you can see from AMD's own numbers here. FSR3 was also announced, and it doesn't appear to be RDNA3 specific, but AMD is certainly not promising anything yet. How it will compare to NVIDIA's DLSS3 tech remains to be seen, but it will be nothing short of fascinating to see how the technology fares, not just in terms of the marketplace, but also the capabilities, and how it will be adopted and implemented by developers. And that's to say nothing of how it will actually perform on different cards, especially, again, because, well, AMD have the dedicated IR units on RDNA, RDNA 3. I wonder if it will be a little bit like XESS, and no, that's not a leak, that's just a guess. So guys, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I think computer graphics going forward is going to be very interesting. Obviously, AMD are the first to jump into a chiplet-based architecture for consumer graphics, and it's hard to deny that at some point or another, we have to imagine NVIDIA are going to do the same thing. And I feel that this is most likely going to happen with RTX 50 slash Blackwell. I've mentioned in a couple of videos now from leak perspective that I have heard that NVIDIA are considering an MCM design with Blackwell, but the thing is there are just so many iterations and different designs, and it's going to be very interesting to see what they actually come up with. 
especially how they decide to segment the chip I suspect whatever plans they eventually, you know, show us, it's going to be quite different to AMD's design, and it's going to be very interesting. I'm also very hopeful for Intel going forward too. Um, while Arc, you know, Gen 1 hasn't, you know, Alchemist didn't quite live up to the performance expectations, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, competition is always ever a good thing, and it was their first attempt. I suspect that a lot of it was software related, as many people know anyway, so perhaps a lot of the experience Intel have learned here is going to benefit them going forward. As for AMD, I'm going to be very curious to see what their strategy is going to be like in terms of marketing as well. It's going to be a very interesting generation, I suspect, for everyone involved. And I'm going to be super curious to see how things like the marketing perspective, as well as the approach to developers, because ultimately FSR2 has seen and FSR1 have seen quite widespread adoption. FSR1 has even been implemented in many, let's say, emulators and fan-made projects. So I think AMD in that respect have definitely scored a lot of PR wins. XCSS, of course, has also seen some pretty decent modability. At the end of the day, um, it isn't just the hardware, of course, that talks, but also the wider ecosystem itself. And it's going to be very interesting to see how optimizations take hold over the next while. I think it's fair to say that ray tracing and other future technologies are not going anywhere. And let's face it unreal engine 5 hasn't really hit the market yet i mean sure developers can mess around with it but it's not like there's a glut of ue5 games for example so it's going to be very interesting to see how all of this plays out in the marketplace and i think it's going to be also extremely curious to see what the mid-range is like as well as the low end for both companies at the end of the day um you know while a thousand bucks for example for a card may seem a bargain compared to like, you know, 1600, 1700, 1800 or whatever for the high-end RTX 4090s. It's still a thousand US dollars. That's a lot of money. Um, so if AMD can put out some really decent competitive cards for 150, 200, 300 US dollars, that's going to be very interesting. With that said, guys, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. If you did, it's YouTube. You know what to do. Leave a like and all of that jazz. I'll see you soon. Have an amazing as well as safe day. Bye for now.